I think. Are we going to do an introduction or just? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, um, so, so we're just going to, uh, we're just going to jump in. We've got three very distinguished guests. Well, two, the third will be with us in a second. <laughs> to uh, put this in a broader historical uh, uh, context, um, uh, how has uh, corporate research and innovation evolved? Um, and hopefully this will give us some ideas about the future, which I think it, it interests us all. Um, if, if corporate spending on research is down, well, who's going to pick up the slack? Um, I think becomes a really important question. Um, so let's if start. Um, you've got, I think, the handouts have a bigger bio, so I won't go into it all. But we have here David Hounshell, who's a professor of technology and social change at, at Carnegie at Carnegie Mellon and, and, and a, a very distinguished historian of innovation. And so um, he's going to start talking to us about uh, a bit of the historical uh, arc of, of, um, of R&D, you know, what happened to the DuPonts and the Bell Labs and Xerox Parks and so on. Okay. So David. Thank, thank you, Eduardo. Uh, and thank uh, the organizers of this conference very much and uh, Duke University and the Kauffman Foundation for the invitation. Okay, um, I'm just going to go through some images that I think really speak uh, to historical trends in corporate research. Uh, this is a photograph of the DuPont Experimental Station. And, and I could easily spend an hour and just basically talk about this station and how it really represents the whole arc of corporate research in the United States. It's a perfect, uh, it, in, in many respects, it's a, it's a metaphor for um, a, a century and a quarter of corporate research. Uh, but I just don't have time to do that. So I'm just trying to warm you up a little bit in terms of, of corporate research, particularly in, the, in what is called the golden era, or what uh, Ashish and his colleagues are calling the, the golden goose. Um, so this is uh, the IBM, uh, IBM Watson lab, uh, which was uh, a result of a commitment by IBM to undertake uh, uh, fundamental research or basic research in the 1950s and uh, became a show palace of industrial research um, by a, one of the leading modernist architects. Um, uh, this is the IBM uh, Zurich uh, Research Center, and uh, it also sort of speaks to the globalization uh, of this basic research undertaken by corporate research. So it speaks a little bit to globalization. Not a lot. It's not a huge trend in my presentation, uh, but uh, some Nobel Prizes came out of there. Um, same architect as the uh, Watson Research Lab. This is the uh, uh, GM a technical center in Warren, Michigan. There you go. We're all driving these cars. I, I saw several parked out uh, in front of the Trump Hotel. <laughs> this is also. Note, note the water tower. In just a minute. I'll show you another really landmark water tower. Uh, this is the uh, General Electric uh, uh, a corporate Science and Technology Center, uh, moved out of the very dirty uh, and uh, uh, cramped quarters of the Schenectady uh, factory, the mother factory of General Electric, moved out to the banks of the uh, uh, Mohawk River, uh, Niskayuna, um, into sort of the hinterland. This is also a very important theme of this golden age, is you, you don't locate uh, in, a, in a city or in a factory anymore. Uh, or a concentrated industrial area, you, you locate in the su suburbs and exurbs. Um, and a, a great statement of that is, of course, uh, Bell Labs and its uh, Murray Hill uh, facility. Uh, just just uh, at the end of World War II, uh, moved out from New York. I'll show you the New York lab in just a second. Um, and of course, uh, this is the uh, famous uh, Bell Labs Homedale, uh, which uh, AT&T and Bell Labs uh, abandoned, but uh, you'll note uh, the water tower there. Does anybody recognize that water tower who's not an IBM person or an AT&T person? No, it's in the shape of a transistor. 
I'm going to speak to the transistor. The transistor is an archetype of corporate research and the golden era of research. There's the modernist architect, uh, Aaron uh, Aero Saarinen. There's the famous interior. Now, this is becoming basically a, a, a real estate development and uh, sort of high-end uh, post, uh, post-modern um, suburban development now, uh, this whole facility. Anybody recognize this? This is West Coast corporate research, epitomized. This is the first of the grand show palaces of corporate research. This is the Hughes Research Lab in Ventura, uh, California up uh, over the Pacific, looking out. These are rarefied atmospheres. This is where science is done in the post-World War period in the, in the Golden Age. Anybody recognize this one? This is sort of the, the last of the really grand uh, California-style central research labs. This is the Science Center of North American Aviation which is one of the great, great stories of, of the waning days of, of corporate science. There it is, high up uh, on the hill. Uh, this is Thousand Oaks, California. There it is. Incredible real estate. Only lasted about f- six years. Uh, some people may be out, out in Redmond. Uh, Microsoft Research, great commitment. <laughs> Stole a lot of people from CMU. We still not forgiving them for that. Uh, CMU managed to get some money, and we have a Gates building for our computer science building. But Bill Gates got the name for only $20 million. Real cheap. The building cost almost $100 million. There's the interior. Uh, this is the uh, Building 99 uh, now at... Uh, uh, the atrium, which is uh, where about half of Microsoft people, research people now, so it's expanded. Okay, so what, uh, so I've warmed you up and given you some images. I don't know how many people have visited these campuses or these research facilities. So, so what I'm going to do now, uh, I'm just basically uh, doing what uh, Ashish told you, uh, is I'm just going to give you sort of the roadmap. Um, and this roadmap is a, is a conceptual framework and uh, it's, the curve is essentially what I'm calling the perception of degree of internalization of corporate R&D needs from 1850 to 2050. So you can see the curve there. I'm going to, f- first of all, talk about the R&D pioneers. And by the way, Ashish Shoal about half my fire, let me say that. So he's a very careful reader of my work. So, OK. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about the R&D pioneers, most of my talk there. Then I'm going to talk about this golden age of corporate research. You've already seen the imagery, OK? Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the declining commitment. Uh, and I see my T is off in the figure, but it's there in my, in my uh, slide deck here picture, OK? Um, so now remember, this is not reality. This is not necessarily reality. This is perceptions, okay? Although I think it does fit somewhat uh, Shisha's and his colleagues' data on this. Okay, so let's talk about the the corporate uh, research uh, pioneers. I'm I'm really, uh, so I've done a lot on this uh, because of my work on DuPont, but um, General Electric was the pioneer in the United States. It was modeled in part upon the Germans, and that's because Everybody who had a PhD um, uh, in either physics or chemistry had a German PhD. Uh, and if you basically uh, wanted to hire a cutting edge scientist, you basically had to think in Germany. A lot of it was based upon the model of the German chemical industry, particularly in the dye stuffs business, and beginning to be uh, fine chemical uh, pharmaceutical business. Bayer, BASF, Herxt, et cetera. OK, uh, General Electric came. Uh, uh, first, then DuPont uh, with its uh, experimental station in 1903, although its first corporate lab was really 1902. Uh, AT&T, uh, 1909, uh, Kodak in uh, 2012, 
and a handful of others basically before 1915. And I have the whole set on, on this, but anyway. So let me just tell you, this is a very significant moment in US history um, because it, it launches a new framework for doing science uh, and a kind of new sociology for doing science. And it's part of what the late great uh, dean of uh, American business history uh, called the rise of the visible hand of management, okay? It's part of the integration, that is integration of research and development into the corporation, right? Into large science-based firms. Uh, prior to the, the uh, arrival, the building of these large science-based firms, uh, firms mainly relied upon the market, markets for their innovation, for their technology. They bought it. There was a robust market of uh, sometimes uh, academic inventors, other times non-academic inventors, but uh, most of the innovation was bought on the market or invention on the market. Uh, firms decided uh, in this period, which is very heavily marked uh, by the shadow of antitrust proceedings in the United States and enforcement, increased enforcement, they decided essentially to uh, rely, no longer rely on the market and to internalize this, basically to integrate backwards into innovation invention, into science. Uh, and uh, what this integration did, it really lowered the, the uncertainties associated with innovation. There are enough uncertainties already, so it lowers uh, these uncertainties and, and also uh, sort of helped uh, hedge against what the, uh, the, the great uh, uh, theorist of innovation, Joseph Schumpeter, called very cleverly, uh, the perennial gale of creative destruction. Um, and uh, in every case, one can see with these corporations, there was some type of core existential threat uh, uh, to the, the corporation's core business or its business model. Um, and, and, and so the, the, the integration backward into research was this response to this core uh, threat. Uh, so very good. And as I've mentioned, it's really magnified by uh, um, um, uh, antitrust policy. And I'm going to say more about antitrust in just a minute. OK. Um, so these research labs, um, they had, we're talking about maybe two, three, four, four handfuls of these labs, OK? My models are four right now. Uh, they had an influence well beyond their corporation and, and their, their, their stockholders. Um, and the research directors themselves uh, also had uh, uh, influence on American science and technology uh, for at least a generation, but, but really for up until the 1970s, let's call it. We're talking about Willis Whitney of GE, Charles Reese of DuPont, uh, Frank Jewett of AT&T, and Kenneth Meese of, of Kodak. Uh, and I, I don't have time to elaborate on that, but uh, what Whitney did at, at General Electric Research Lab, uh, simply because of the funding model, he recognized that he had to make science pay in the corporation. And that was the challenge, and he met that challenge. Um, with, a, with a stunning breakthrough, he suffered one nervous breakdown before that stunning breakthrough. After that stunning breakthrough in 1911, he was on easy street, and the lab grew, and it became much more heavily funded by corporate, okay? He managed the first uh, Nobel Prize winning scientist, Irving Langmuir, in chemistry for his work on surface chemistry, okay? So that's uh, General Electric. Uh, this is DuPont. We're back to the experimental station. Charles Rees, the founding uh, director of, of uh, DuPont's Eastern Research Laboratory, and really the, the, the chemi what was called the chemical director, but he was the overall corporate director of R&D. And he was the one who built a very strong central research program during the decade of 1910 to 1920. During World War I, he presided over the largest research organization in the United States, DuPont became, because of the critical of, of uh, gunpowder, explosives, uh, TNT, et cetera, uh, and because of DuPont's diversification effort because of the antitrust policies that it's facing. I don't have time to explain that. 
but uh, it begins in 1903 down in this little uh, War of 1812 mill. When the mill burns in, in 1906, they move across the river and build the first building and experimental station. And over time, corporate research simply expands all the way up until the upper right-hand corner into biotechnology with a very bold uh, laboratory committed to basic science uh, in biotechnology <coughs> built in 1984. Uh, the thing that, uh, uh, so here's Bell Labs. Uh, this is Frank Jewett. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, when Bell Labs was formally incorporated in 1925. Jewett was the first uh, director, the first president of that. Uh, but in 1909, uh, AT&T faced a challenge of radio. Uh, it, 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 couldn't, uh, it had a challenge, essentially, of coast-to-coast -coast, uh, telephony. And it had to do basic research to solve this problem. Uh, Jewett uh, was the guy who presided over that basic research hired the right people, um, and the rest is history. Uh, about uh, 1912 or so, AT&T committed, the Theodore Vail, basically committed to make the company a regulated monopoly. And what uh, the funding model of AT&T became for its research is basically a tax on every person who leased the telephone in the United States from AT&T. Uh, here is Kodak. Uh, this is Kenneth Meese in the upper right. Uh, Kodak Lab, circa 1920, there on the left, and, and George Eastman. Eastman was an incredible guy. He gave money as Mr. X to MIT, huge uh, amount, millions of dollars. This is a letter that he wrote to Kenneth Meese, assuring Kenneth Meese of two things Meese wanted, okay? Uh, Meese wanted, number one, he wanted to make sure he got a vacation. And number two, and this is very important, he wanted to make sure that he had an open publication policy. And this is Eastman's response to that, and that allowed. Okay, so um, what these laboratories directors faced also was a very strong growth out of German uh, universities uh, in terms of PhDs of a pure science ideal, a commitment. And to hire top caliber scientists for these labs there had to be concessions with respect to publication. And that would grow, essentially, all the way through uh, into the post-World War II period, really strengthened by post-World War II period. So uh, success breeds growth, a lot of emulation, et cetera. Uh, GE becomes promoted as House of Progress. DuPont announces its a discovery of nylon out of a basic research program of the 1920s, one of the most uh, 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 productive innovations in, in history. Um, and, uh, uh, all of these companies exhibiting at the World's Fair. Uh, Kodak exhibits motion picture film. Bell exhibits first video phone, first of many video phones. Uh, RCA displays uh, uh, its invention and development in the whole decade-long development of, of, of black and white television. And the list goes on and on. I can just go on on that. Industrial research representing the science, AT&T's first Nobel Prize winning. Uh, Clinton Davison uh, on the right is La Irving Lane Muir. So there's the uh, uh, ex uh, painting at DuPont's uh, exhibit at the 1939 World Fair. So World War II simply strengthened this trend. Brilliant successes ushered in this golden age of research. So I'm not going to say a lot about this golden age of research. There's RCA labs at, at Princeton. There's Bell Labs, early 45. There's the expansion of the DuPont Experimental Station, 50, and then another one in 55. Um, so I, I want to close on, in terms of this corporate research, the ideology. This is important. And I'm not going to take time to quote all of these. I've got statements across a sample of firms. But when they built these uh, show palaces in the 50s, essentially all of the corporations were committed to what they believed was pure science, right? Uh, they weren't interested in the, in the D. They made it clear that there was not going to be D out of these laboratories, right? And these basically talk about this. Uh, and in the case of Westinghouse, they basically said, anybody can use our research. If Westinghouse chooses to use our research, fine. If they don't, fine. We're just going to do what we want. That represents this golden era 
Uh, so there's another one. This is the, the North American aviation kind of stuff, an incredible proposal. Um, and this finally, Microsoft uh, Miravolt. Okay, so now let me talk about the d d decline here in the last couple of minutes I have. Uh, so uh, I, I, I really, th there are a number of factors. There are a number of these show laboratories that I've listed. I've probably left some out. This is no particular order. This is just, I started with the top. The top are basically all funded by a DOD program called IRD, Independent Research and Development, where essentially the, the Pentagon wanted essentially central research laboratories across all of its prime contractors. And uh, three of these were funded uh, by uh, IRD funds as well as others, but these were show palaces. Uh, so across these, uh, now let me just give you my list. It's a long list. It's a long, long, laundry list. It's things that are, uh, Ashish and they should do econometrics and test all of these. First of all, it's the end of strong antitrust enforcement, beginning uh, with the election of Ronald Reagan and the Cooperative R&D Act of, 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 uh, of 1984. Competitiveness issues overall, major economic disruptions in the 70s, you can't say the energy crisis, the inflation, et cetera, just destroyed corporate research because it really drove corporate. Uh, major institutional investors, short-termism, et cetera, consolidations, mergers, and hostile takeovers, and literally the disintegration of industry. The chemical industry basically disintegrates after 1980. The Bayh-Dole Act, which may be related, breakdown of Mertonian norms of pure science, offshoring of manufacturing, this question came up earlier, uh, restrictions on open science uh, in the CRADA program, the Cooperative Research and Development, which basically ended uh, developed a lot of secrecy and ended open science by publication by these central corporate labs. Tectonic shift from hardware to software uh, and uh, the end of the Cold War and the weakening of R&D programs in general. And finally, the simple economics of basic research in industry. So that's uh, where I'm gonna end. I'll leave you with this wonderful image of one of the iconic labs uh, that was funded, that was basically founded by one of these guys who literally traces through from the Westinghouse program that I alluded to, to Ford Scientific, and he is the guy who's at, the chief technology officer at IBM who implements the program to build the park. And the park Xerox is a, a, another one of these stories about corporate research. So I thank you. Thank you very much, David. Um, we'll have time for questions at the end of the presentation, but now let's proceed to uh, listen to Cal Corrado. Um, uh, she's a uh, research director in economics at, at the conference board, and she's going to talk to us a little bit about the economic context of this and what are, what are some of the, um, how, how does some of this play out in the broader economy? Um, Carol. Okay, well, it gives me great pleasure to be here. How do I get my slides? Um, Just go to the next slide. There we go. So. Those aren't Good. mine. Oh, I've got your. There we go. That's forward, that's backward. These that's aren't forward. mine. That's one, I think. This. Maybe it's at the end. I think it ought to be one. It should be. Okay, well, uh, well let me get started. Um, Oh, you so we went back to yeah, there. There we go. Oh, okay, go okay. great. Good. I should have put that. Up. I'm sorry. Carol. Oh, thank you. Um, so um, let me just say a couple things to to start with, and then I'll. I'll get into uh, a sort of a deeper discussion. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that, you know, from the perspective of uh, working with the business community at the conference board, um, you don't hear the word science, much less even R&D, except for among certain firms. Um, now, on the other hand, the word innovation is a buzzword, uh, is, uh, it, it, it's just a, the be all and end all, uh, along with um, we can't find the workers we need. Um, so, um, 
so I am going to go sort of over a, a few topics, um, starting with science and scientific knowledge, uh, and then very quickly going to the 30,000 feet, you know, what do we know about uh, innovation and how the two may be related. But the first thing I want to say is that the work that Ashish presented uh, is, is not only very thorough, it's very nuanced. I mean, it really is sort of a body of work that distinguishes between the R and the D in a very careful way, in a way that tries to help us, you know, understand how these activities are in fact rather different. Um, and um, as someone who uh, works on measuring productivity, analyzing productivity, what the role of R&D is in productivity, um, and there's a lot of people who do that, uh, they don't make this distinction. Uh, you can write down models where there's this, you know, knowledge in the ether that, you know, you pluck down and, you know, put to use uh, to get people to part with their money. I mean, you know, that, that's sort of what most of that community sort of worries about. So we really are talking about when we ask the question, should we worry, uh, we need to sort of rethink, you know, the sort of body of work that, um, that has certain um, you know, strains to it uh, as to whether uh, this, in fact, is a little bit of a disruptor in, in how we've modeled and understood uh, the development so far. So I don't have much time, and I'm going to go over some of this stuff very quickly, and uh, I'll even drop a topic if I run out of time. Is somebody going to warn me? Okay, great. Okay, so... Uh, what may be responsible for the decline in corporate research? Uh, oh, yeah, I'm an economist, too. Uh, so let's talk about demand and supply. Uh, and I'm going to just go up, up a little level uh, from the demand and supply that, that Ashish talked about. But it, it's very related. It's, this slide did not translate very well. It really looked a lot prettier. It was laid out perfectly. Um, I should have sent a PDF. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, what can I say? Uh, so supply. Um, again, from the point of view of innovation. Uh, well, innovation opportunities, both domestically and globally, you know, could actually be more plentiful given the stock of scientific knowledge. I mean, you know, that could be a reason why corporations don't feel they need to invest as much as they did in the past. Now, it's a little short-sighted, you could say. Uh, if, for, for, for example, the reason is globalization, you have a stock of knowledge, you have a way of business, you have a brand. Um, I'm doing well in the United States. Well, let me just replicate that model in Europe. Let me just replicate that model in, in South America. Let me just replicate it in China. Well, the marketing doesn't translate so easily, but the science does. Um, and, you know, and I think we, uh, we, we have to sort of work that into the, 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 the picture if we're talking about these large firms. Um, and, and is there any sort of evidence for that at all? Uh, well, I mean, the work that I've done, which tries to take a broader look at, take a broad look at innovation, uh, shows that investments in product development, digitization, uh, and management improvements remain relatively strong. Uh, they're not declining. They were on the up, uptick, and they've leveled off recently, uh, but that's... Um, sort of prima facie evidence that there's a lot of investments by firms in trying to make innovations that then makes them more profitable. Um, well, the demand for science-based innovation ha may have declined. I've heard this. Um, this is, we are a service economy. You know, we're not making manufactured products only anymore. Uh, well, you know, there's some truth to 
the fact that a large swath of business is not much of a user of science other than the digital world. Okay, um, that would be my profession. Uh, that might be most of your professions if you are analysts. Um, but it just doesn't make sense. Uh, we have a growing role of health. Uh, and I, you know, the other thing I've heard is we don't, you know, need, the Defense Department doesn't need to invest in science anymore. Um, uh, you know, we've got cyber threats. Uh, I don't think so. Um, so, you know, the idea that we're a service economy and not a manufacturing economy, I don't think sort of holds up, but that's, um, those are the sort of right there, supply and demand, being an economist, that's the most important thing that I'm going to say. Now, it's not just about supply and demand. There's something called the innovation ecosystem that perhaps a lot of people in this room have uh, studied. Um, and, and that's the idea that, that, you know, innovation is thought to emanate from some sort of squishy thing that we haven't, we don't necessarily get our arms around all that well. And that it has a certain dynamics of its own. Um, and, you know, corporate research has undoubtedly been an important part of that dynamic and no one knows how how that ecosystem works when you pull the plug on one thing from it, okay? And so Ashish and his colleagues have shown that uh, an important part of that ecosystem is in decline. Um, and, you know, we, we aren't very well equipped to understand what that may mean, um, period. I don't have much more to say. Uh, however, um, and now here's where I'll get to innovation. The, uh, you know, the other thing that makes it very difficult to answer that question, which is what Ashish, this is where they're going, um, is that the success of the innovation system, you know, depends in part on, a, a, you know, a healthy business environment. It, it's, you know, it's not Galapagos, okay? Uh, it's unfortunately in the United States of America where we've had, you know, a major financial crisis. And, um, and a downtrend in the long-term rate of growth. Before I get to that, um, I wanted to provide uh, a perspective on the long-term trends in three different segments of R&D, and the emphasis here is on the D, shall we say. Um, this, these are data from the national accounts, um, and, um, you know, which is based upon the NSF data that, that she showed. Um, and this is the investment by the business sector in three different broad types of R&D. And we have seen relative to GDP, so this is like an investment rate, okay? When an investment rate goes up, uh, it, normally means that the rate of growth of the underlying stock is going up, okay? Uh, the, it's rate of growth, okay? Uh, when it levels off, it means more or less that the rate of growth is constant, okay? Now, th those are just two very broad, not necessarily accurate, they're only accurate at a broad level. Uh, so it is, you know, so we have had businesses parting with money to invest in ICT at an increasing rate throughout history, except for the dot-com bubble. Uh, we have had until about 2007, businesses invest in health-related ex research, ex uh, sorry, development expenditures uh, at an increasing rate. Um, and who knows what the last point means. Um, on the other hand, all other types of R&D um, were on a 20-year decline from 1983 to roughly the early 2000s, and then now have leveled off. So if we want to say, uh, so this is the D mostly, okay, why, well, I could go into the details, but uh, this is the D. Um, just sort of bear this in mind, okay? We've got a lot of activity in the digital sector, a lot of activity in the health sector, 
and you know decline and finally a leveling off, uh, which just means you're in an equilibrium. You're just you're just keeping things up, okay? Um, so now when we go to 30,000 feet and look at what is the fruits of innovation, you know, which is normally thought to be total factor productivity, and I see that this slide really got disturbed because the, I know, I did this on a Mac, you downloaded it onto a Windows machine. Um, yeah, right, which, uh, um, so let, let, me, let me go quickly here because uh, it may be, I won't even ask you to, to, to look at the chart. Um, it, it, it says a couple things. Um, it says that um, the, the labor productivity uh, had a golden age from 1995 uh, to uh, 2005 where it grew 3% per year. That's way above historical average. The historical average is 2% per year, uh, which you see prevailed um, in the next five years on average. Um, and then what people are worried about now is the last five years, uh, where it's grown a mere four-tenths percent per year. Um, so, uh, so, so that's, that's the big picture. Underneath it all, the multi-factor productivity uh, began to slow down, uh, actually around 2004. Uh, then we had a financial crisis in 2008, and weak investment sort of since then. And you know that sort of explains what's going on in the uh, the, la the labor productivity. Now, I hesitated to include this chart based upon the official figures, but I thought it would be less confusing if this was all I presented, even though it's hard to read. It, in principle, it's pretty clear. Um, the, the, the thing is that there um, are um, many measurement issues um, that, uh, that people have studied. Um, and again, the outline here on this chart, it, it's sort of very ugly. Uh, but the bottom line is that uh, when you try to sort through what may be going on in the aggregate statistics from the point of view of a, whether the digital sector is being mismeasured, and B, whether pharma is being mismeasured, you come to the conclusion that the rest of the economy, and this doesn't just mean the other R&D performing sectors, which you say, oh, I'm not surprised. Uh, oh, sorry, the rest of the economy, TFP is declining, and it's declining at a rate of about two tenths percent per year, um, and that's for the past 10 years. Um, it, it suffered in the financial crisis, um, and it's continued. Um, the pullback in the R&D may explain the R&D performing sectors, um, but there is a mystery about the rest of the economy. So I think you know, corporate, the decline in corporate research, again, this nuance, um, you know, could be you know part of the explanation of at least what's happening in the R and D performing sector. And again, it's one of the pieces of the puzzle. Now, does this mean that there are no returns to R and D, or that there's fewer spillovers from R and D? I'm sort of going pretty fast now. I skipped over the conventional uh, explanation of what multi-factor productivity is. Uh, but you know, if there's excess returns to R&D, you're going to find it there. Uh, if there's spillovers from R&D, you're going to find it there. Uh, so we saw that it was huge in 95 to 2005. And then it's like 4 tenths per year for the past 10 years. Um, but the answer is no. And that's because there's another measurement problem, and that's that the corporations are shifting their R&D generated income abroad. And this is hot off the presses mm -hmm. from Fatih Gouvenon and some uh, colleagues, some uh, his co-authors who are from BEA, uh, that suggests that, how did this come out? OK, this isn't so bad. That by 2012, uh, the United States had 
earned on the IP that it generated uh, $280 billion more than what's in US GDP. Um, and that is, I think, about equally split between ICT and pharma. OK, so the R&D performing sectors aren't doing as bad as we thought they were. Um, they, they, you know, that IP has been generating a lot of, a lot of income. Um, the rest of the economy, though, is, is, is pretty, pretty bad. Um, and let me skip over that. Um, because I think I'm out of time, and um, um, and just sort of conclude by saying that the decline in corporate research probably has had uh, an impact on the innovation ecosystem and the innovation outcomes as measured by MFP growth. And I think you know the the thing that's going to allow one to identify that is the is not the pharma sector, not the IC, ICT sector, because there's so much going on there but all the other industries where it's gone to zip and they aren't doing very well. Um, so, you know, again, if it's just as a bridge to the policy uh, discussion, um, we really need like an estimate of what that may be uh, to sort of then take the next step as to whether policy should do something about it. Um, and I think I just want to repeat what um, I heard somebody say at a conference Wes and I were at just a couple weeks ago, which was Scott Stern of MIT, who said, you know, we can't just keep on saying that, that you know, this stuff, this spending uh, boosts long-term growth. We have to be a lot more precise and give a lot more meaningful um, fodder to the people who are making the budget decisions because you you know it a lot of things are being cut um, why should you cut why should you increase funding for science research uh, has to be pretty compelling um, and, um, and and the other thing is and I say grillicus re redux I mean what I mean here is uh, one should never expect that there's you know, one single answer to uh, something like why we have such slow productivity growth, uh, because we had a productivity paradox before. That was productivity paradox one. Uh, and the last thing that was ever said on that uh, was a wonderful review by Z. Grillicus, who actually asked the specific question did the decline in public spending on R&D cause the step down in productivity growth, you know, in the, in the productivity paradox number one? Um, and he went through all the reasons. Well, there was this going on. There was that going on. Um, and he concluded by saying that it was just like murder on the Oregon Oriental Express, they all did it. And so, you know, I think we have to bear that in mind. This isn't the only thing that's going on. Uh, but you're unplugging the ecosystem. You've had a decline in the industries where we've seen probably the greatest pullback. Um, and those, you're beginning to connect the dots of how, you know, one might frame a policy discussion along these lines. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Karen. So now we're just gonna jump in with uh, Bill Reduschel here, who is a, an inventor, tech executive, I don't know exactly how to refer to you, but worked at, you know, Retired. AOL uh, Corner, Sun, uh, you know, to, to Liquid Sky, yeah. and... Uh, I do everything. <laughs> I, I'm, the, uh, I'm the practitioner here. I did the first uh, R&D shifting tax shelter that I know of for a public company in the U.S. in 1992. <laughs> and uh, we went to see the Deputy Minister of Finance in the Netherlands, and we were having a discussion with him about moving a lot of business into the Netherlands. It was going to employ a lot of people. And he said, I can't do that. I'm sorry, I wish I could, but the Treaty of Rome, the European Union, this isn't allowed, I can't do that. 
And we got up and we're on our way to Zurich, uh, to actually Geneva, to Switzerland, which could do things. And he said, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I can't do that. But let me switch hats. I'm now the deputy inspector of taxes for the Netherlands Antilles. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> and he said, I can do that there. And we said, well, that won't do us any good. Uh, he said, well, if you were a Dutch company with fiscal unity with the Netherlands Antilles company done before the Treaty of Rome, then that tax break would apply inside the EU. And we said, well, we didn't exist until 1982. Treaty of Rome is 58. He said, well, that's not a problem. And he handed us a list of 600 of these companies. Uh, 